Aloha and good afternoon. Thank you for joining us. We know that people are trickling into the room. We see you and we are uh, pushing a few more buttons. We'll get started in just a minute or two. We know you're here. We're looking forward to today's presentation called Hawaii Sons of the Civil War. And we will open up the webinar in just a moment. Mahalo. Aloha and good afternoon. Thank you for bearing with us. We are, um, this presentation is being recorded and we're planning to live stream it as well. So if you will hang in there while we get the live stream started, um, and I think it's working, fantastic. All right, we will get started in about 15 seconds. Thank you so much for joining us this afternoon. Wonderful. All right. Uh, November 11th, 2021. It's Veterans Day in America. And we have a very special presentation. My name is Kim Kuule Bernie. I am with Papa Ololokahi uh, with Communications and Community Outreach. And it's my very, um, it's my pleasure to this afternoon to uh, introduce my friend and an expert in many things Hawaiian history. But let me get a few of our housekeeping details out of the way first. Please know that this presentation hosted by Papa Ololokahi is being recorded for, um, for future reference and we will house it on our Vimeo page in a couple of weeks. Uh, we're also live streaming on Facebook. So welcome to all of you who are tuning in, whether you're on Facebook or listening in on Zoom. If you have any questions or any comments throughout, please feel free to put them in the chat or to put them in the comment section on Facebook and we'll get to them as soon as we can. Nanette's got a very rich presentation this afternoon. So we're going to uh, encourage her to get through uh, all of her um, all of her rich information that she has to share with us. And if there's time at the end, and I think there will be, we'll be taking some questions and she can answer quite we she can provide some answers for you as well. So uh, without further delay, let me introduce Nanette Naoma Napoleon is a freelance researcher writer and researcher uh, focused on the histories and cultures of Hawaii. She's best known as being the state's expert on historic cemeteries and burial grounds. And she's the author of a book, O'ahu Cemetery, Burial Ground and Historic Site. Nanette is currently writing a book with the same title of today's presentation, Hawaii Sons of the Civil War, which focuses on Hawaii's connections to the war between the states and the men from the Kingdom of Hawaii who participated in that brutal four-year conflict. It's my pleasure this afternoon to introduce you to my friend, Nanette Napoleon. Aloha, Nanette. How are you? But we need, yeah, you know what I'm going to say, right? You're muted. <laughs> Aloha noi kako. Nanette Napoleon here in Kailua. Thank you for having me. Thank you for Papa Ololokahi and all the work uh, that done by Kim and the two momies to put this together. I appreciate that. So should we get started? Yes, please. Yeah. Maybe can you give us a quick, uh, a, tell us how you got interested in this particular topic. Okay. Um, yeah, a lot of people ask me that. It was uh, more than 10 years ago, maybe closer to 20 years ago, I was doing some freelance research work for somebody and I was in the, uh, the basement of uh, Hawaii State 
uh, library looking at some uh, microfilm and I was looking for my topic and as you have to do in these things, you go page by page if you don't know the page and you look for your subject matter. Well, I was doing that and I came across this article that caught my eye written by um, Samuel Chapman Armstrong, who was a missionary son who was born in the islands and he fought in the war. And so he wrote letters home and one of his letters uh, ended up in, in the newspaper locally. And it said that he met some other Hawaiians in the Civil War. Um, <laughs> and I, I went, what? Literally I, out loud in the basement of the library, I went, what? Hawaiians were in the Civil War? You gotta be kidding me. I never heard of this. And, and I had a friend who was the researcher next to me on the machine. And I told her, come look at this. There's Hawaiians who served in the Civil War. How, how is that possible? So that started me on a years, years long journey to um, study th this topic, you know, men from Hawaii, Hawaiians included. So I've been yeah. at this for many, many years. Thank you so much. That's fascinating, Annette. Now we look forward to, to learning more. Okay, let's get started. <clears throat> so most of you know that the Civil War, I hope most of you know this, that it started in 1861 and ended in 1865. And the official date of the start of the war was April 12th, 1861 upon the firing of guns at Fort Sumter, Charleston Harbor, South Carolina. Now, one day prior, we were still a unified nation. There was no North and uh, Confederates and Union forces. But since that day, April 12th, that was a day that triggered a cascade of Southern states uh, secession from the Union. It didn't happen all at once. They all seceded at once, but uh, through a long period of time. Now, um, or se several months. Now, my presentation includes non-Hawaiians in it, and I, I'm going, to, because we want to focus more on Hawaiian, I'm going to sort of uh, not, you know, pass them up completely, but I'll, I want to get to the Hawaiians in particular. <clears throat> so, in the same year, 1861, just a few months after April when the war started, uh, the news of the, the uh, the war came to went around the, the whole world like wildfire. And the news came to the Hawaiian Islands, the Kingdom of Hawaii, and um, King Kamehameha IV decided to follow the lead of, of European countries like Great Britain and France and other countries that declared their countries neutral in this conflict. They didn't want to get involved in somebody else's country's civil war. So Hawaii followed suit, the king issued a proclamation of which I have the original copy of that's available at the Hawaii State uh, Library. And I'm going to read you um, just the, the beginning part of it, it's kind of long. It says here, be it known to whom it may concern that I, Kamehameha IV, King of the Hawaiian Islands, having been officially notified that hostilities are now unhappily pending between the government of the United States and certain states thereof styling themselves the Confederate States of America, hereby proclaim our neutrality between said contending parties. So the federal, uh, the government under the King said, okay, no boys, there, you know, there's no, we can't fight in that war. It's a uh, couple, we can't do that. But there were, interestingly enough, there were two groups that wanted to go and formed, uh, formed a groups to, to go off uh, uh, as militia units to fight in the war. One was Spencer's Invincibles out of Hilo. And um, they, uh, Thomas Spencer was a merchant over there. And he formed one, uh, he formed a group called Spencer's Invincibles uh, with the intent of going to the America to fight in the war. Um, there was also uh, boys at Punahou School, then known as Oahu College, who formed a volunteer unit as well. And they wanted to march off, sail to the mainland and then march off to war. 
but because of the neutrality proclamation, they weren't able to do that. Although Spencer, he spent a lot of time trying to get his boys over there uh, who were mostly Native Hawaiian. Uh, he, he, he had correspondence with government officials in Washington, government officials in Honolulu, uh, and he fought, he, he did a lot of, to try to get his boys over there, but uh, no, could, no could do. <clears throat> but that didn't stop individuals from Hawaii from participating in the war. You couldn't be part of a group like Punahou volunteers or uh, Spencer's Invincibles, but you could go off on your own. The two <clears throat> people that I know the most of our, about, uh, one was Samuel Chapman Armstrong, who was a missionary son and he contributed a lot. And then the, mo the Hawaiian that I know most about was, his name was Henry Ho'olulu Pittman. And I'll talk about him shortly. To date, I've identified um, about 83 individuals. The count has gone up and down over the years, uh, but right now it's at 83 uh, who fought in the conflict. Now, Hawaii, uh, it seems like, like, why would somebody in the Pacific uh, go and fight in the war? There were not only uh, people from Hawaii, people from Samoa and, and other countries, you know, Pacific Islanders in the war as well. Most of those uh, guys, almost all of them from Hawaii served in Northern forces. 95% of our guys served in nor nor Northern forces. And the state that most of them uh, uh, enlisted in was Massachusetts. Now I have to give all this background. I can't just jump into, okay, here, here's our veterans and things, because you have to know the backstory a little, the context, you have to put it in context. So you have to know a little bit about uh, the conflict in general. So the reason why our guys mostly enlisted in the North was for three reasons. One was because whaling was so uh, such a big uh, engine driver, uh, economy engine driver in the islands and the whalers were hundreds of ships would come to port in Honolulu and Lahaina and other places. Uh, and so that was one uh, link to nor uh, the northern forces. Then Protestant missionaries who came in 1820, they were highly influential in the kingdom at that time during the war period. And then um, sugar was important because the United States was um, uh, because in the United States, sugar was mostly grown in the South, not in the North. And when the war broke out, they stopped trading. The North and the South stopped trading. And so uh, sugar became scarce in the North. And so the, the uh, uh, sugar, cane, sugar cane became more important to ship to the Northern forces. Okay, not the Southern forces, but the Northern forces. So it became an economic importance. So uh, at the beginning of the war, the uh, sugar here in Hawaiian Islands sold for only 14 cents a pound. By the end of the Civil War in 1865, it was 24 cents a pound and over five, about 5.3 million pounds of sugar was being shipped off to the north. Making, that's then the period that um, they coined the term King Sugar. You know? So who are the individuals from Hawaii who served in the Civil War? I'm not gonna talk about these guys too much, but they're the missionary sons, a whole bunch of them, and uh, including three sets of brothers, one who died in action. And all of these, except for uh, the lineman, uh, the one who was killed, William uh, Forbes, uh, survived and they were veterans. Uh, well, uh, Armstrong, long story, but he he um, fought in the uh, fought in the war, he, and he at the age of 23, and three years later he did, was discharged at the end, age of 26 as a, a brigadier brevet brigadier general, and he went on to found Hamptons uh, Hamptons Normal at uh, Hamptons Normal School and he became a very prominent figure in um, education. 
I'm not gonna, I'm gonna skip this part because he's not Hawaiian. But because of, uh, in the year 1863, the government declared emancipation for, for blacks. And it also opened the door to be able to uh, enlist colored, uh, colored men. Before, the, before 1863, the two years leading up to that of the war, blacks were not taken into the war. And this is significant because they feared that the blacks would take over, they'll kill the officers and take over. It's a long story, but lo and behold, our Hawaiian boys end up, and some of them end up in colored troops by virtue of their color of their skin. Here's a le letter that was written by Armstrong about race and, and colored people. It says, the African race is before the world and all of mankind are looking to see whether the Africans, in which would be inclusive of colored, other colored people, uh, will show himself equal to the opportunity before him. And their future, in my opinion, rests largely upon the success of the Negro troops in this war. It will be a grand thing to have been identified with this Negro movement. So after the uh, end of the war in 1866, the, the period called Reconstruction, which was from 1866 to 1877, and they needed uh, to, all of a sudden they got millions of freed slaves and they needed housing for them, medical and legal assistance, education. So what the newly re uh, reunified United States, they uh, put together a program called the Freedmen's Bureau and to, to build schools and other things for slaves, ex-slaves. Uh, so here's Samuel Armstrong who, who established Hampton Normal and Agricultural Institute in Hampton University. And that model was based on a model uh, created in Hilo, the Hilo Boarding School, which was founded in 1836 by uh, Samuel Chapman Armstrong's father the Reverend Richard Armstrong, and then his cohort, Reverend David Lyman. So they created Hilo, uh, Hilo Boarding School, and then Samuel created Hampton based on Hilo Boarding School. The famous, uh, most famous person at Hampton was Booker T. Washington, the favorite student of uh, Armstrong, and they became close, close friends over the years. I was able to go one summer to Hampton to uh, look through the archives for uh, Samuel Armstrong's collection and I found a lot of information there and uh, including, and then there's a cemetery on the grounds where Armstrong is buried and this is his marker. And you'll see a big lava rock there, which came from the big island was shipped over there. So let's look at the Hawaiians in the civil war. Um, I have 32 who were in the Union Navy, 17 who were in the Union Army, and 10 in the Confederate Navy. The Confederate Navy is, is kind of, was kind of like an abnormality, but I'll explain that later. So Hawaiians of the people I have consisted of 71% of the, the people that I know something about. Uh, this is a letter from our Samuel's brother, who was written in the Friend in 1865 after the war. Uh, no, it was during the war. Yesterday, as my orderly was holding my horse, I asked him where he was from in Hawaii. He proved to be a full-blooded Kanaka by the name of Kealoha, who came from the islands last year. There is also another by the name of Kaivi, who lived near Judge Smith's, who left the islands last July. I enjoyed seeing them very much and we had a good jabber in Kanaka. Keola is a private in the 41st Regiment US Colored Troops and Kaivi is a private in the 28th Colored Troops. Both are good men and seem glad to have seen me. So the picture on your right is not of one of these guys, Keola or Kaivi, but a, this is a picture from a Hawaiian during that period, uh, how, how they looked. Now, I tried to find uh, more information about Kealoha and Kaivi, who both came, who were veterans of the war and came back here, but it's 
you know, trying to find records for Hawaiians in the Civil War is very, very difficult. I can find a lot of information about the missionary sons or any other Caucasian guy because they were more literate and they were more, um, they wrote letters prolifically, they corresponded a lot. So I find out lots and lots about them. Uh, they kept journals and biographies of each other and uh, lots of things, but Hawaiians didn't do that so much at that period still. So it's very, very difficult to identify Hawaiians who served in the Civil War. And, and it's more even more hard to figure out if they survived the war. Here's a letter from Armstrong's brother, Richard Armstrong in 1867 after the war. Um, in Petersburg, Virginia one day last month, I met two Kanaka who were working in a tobacco factory. One of them recognized me and called out, Pake. I had to stop and laugh and had a good long chat with them. Poor fellows. They had been in the army and were hard at work. They informed me that at least 100 Kanakas had served in the army and that a large number of them had been killed. So let's look at the um, Hawaiians in the Union Army, okay, first. So here's a list of 17 who identified who served in the Union Army. And they served in um, all in the north, of course, Pennsylvania, Massachusetts, Rhode Island, Virginia, more Massachusetts, Connecticut, Pennsylvania, again, Pennsylvania, Massachusetts, Massachusetts, and New York. So all of these are northern uh, states. And look at the names that they registered or enlisted under, especially the names like um, here, down here, John Kanaka, Friday Kanaka. Those aren't the, the uh, you see that, um, you know that those, those aren't the real names of these people. What happened was Hawaiians and other foreigners, they would get to a recruiting station and there'd be a table there and some sergeant at the desk or lieutenant and you get in a line and you get up to the tent and uh, the guy, interviewer guy would say, what's your name boy? And they would say, Israel Kamakavi Nope, your name is, your name is John Boy. Your name is Friday Kanaka. Your name is John Kanaka. So they would give them these misnomers uh, or fake names because the intake guys couldn't deal with these foreign names. They didn't know how to pronounce them. They didn't know how to write it, how to write it down. So unfortunately, a lot of our guys ended up with uh, different names. And because of that, we don't know, if, we don't, if I don't know their Hawaiian name, I can't search them to find out more about them in Hawaii. You know, what was their family name? What, 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 where did they come from in Hawaii? Can't, I have none of that on, on, on most of our Hawaiians. So it's always been a, a hard th thing for me to reconcile all these years is that so many of the guys, uh, I haven't been able to reach her that well. Here's a guy named Prince Romerson. You know, it's hard to believe that that's his real name, but there it is. Uh, okay, but the most, uh, the Hawaiian I know the most about is Henry Ho'olulu Pittman, aka Timothy Pittman. Timothy was his baptismal name, which he got at Kauai Ha'o Church. Uh, he was born in 1845. His parents were the high chiefess of Hilo, Kino Ole Ole Liha, who married a foreigner, an immigrant named Benjamin Pittman, who was from Boston. So, uh, Henry came from high Ali'i class. Kina Ole Ole Liho was very high chiefess. So here's a genealogy chart showing Henry down here. He had two sis sisters, an older sister named Ma Marianne Kina Ole Pittman, and an uh, older brother named Benjamin Franklin Keola Pittman. Henry's in the middle. So there mother was Kina Ole who married Benjamin Pickman. Kina Ole's father was the high chief Ho'olulu, very, very important chief in Hawaiian history, connected with Kamehameha. And his father was yet a higher chief, Kame'e Aimoku. 
um, and he had a twin brother named Kamanava, and the tw twin brothers were advisors to and uncles to King Kamehameha the first. The two men you see, uh, all of you have seen our, our coat of arms, and most people don't know who these two guys are. Maybe they, a lot of people think, oh, it's just made up. No, these represent Kamanava and Kamehameha. So Henry descends from high, high uh, chiefly line. There was, when I uh, was doing research, I came across an ancestor of Henry um, named Kina Oli Pittman Spieler, who lived in Kailua when she was alive, she passed away, but I was able to meet her at her home a couple of times and interviewed her and got a lot of information from her uh, about that. But um, yeah, she, she passed away. Not, not too long ago, uh, but she's a descendant of Henry, Henry's brother, Benjamin. So uh, in uh, August, um, I can't read my screen. Kim, I have these things, this thing I can't read at the top of my screen. Because uh, that let's see, it says August 14th, 1862, private. 22nd yep. Massachusetts Volunteer Infantry. Okay, I got that. Okay. So um, Henry's listed in th these three major battles, the Battle of Bull Run, Battle of Antietam, and Battles of Sharpsburg, all very famous battles at the beginning of the war. Um, on November 30th, 1862, while on a long march to Fredericksburg, Virginia, Henry was taken prisoner by General James Stewart's cavalry. James Stewart was a famous flamboyant, uh, break the rules kind of guy in the army. And um, he, he got, uh, was notorious for his, <laughs> the way he operated as a general. And people in the, in the North were very scared of his troops because they were very uh, ruthless, some say. So there was Henry, he's on a, uh, He's marching on the way to Fr Fredericksburg. They're marching several hundred miles in, in um, only like four or five days. And along that long march, Henry gets sick and he's marching with his buddy, his buddy's on his side. And he tells his buddy, I'm, I'm not feeling well. I need to sit down and rest for a while under that tree over there. And um, the friend says, no, no, Henry, you can't do that because somebody will, come, you know, find out when I, it, when I get there and, and Henry tells his friend, go ahead, go ahead, I'll, I'll catch up with you. And the friend says, no, no, if I get there and, and then you, they can't find you, they're going to call roll call. And if your name isn't on the list to be, having gotten there, they're going to send somebody back out to arrest you for a dereliction of duty and abandoning your bandit abandonment. So, um, but Henry said, no, I, I can't, I can't, I can't. So the friend left him and he says, okay, I'm gonna go, I'm gonna go to the end and then I'm gonna send somebody back to get you. But in the meantime, my Henry was underneath the tree, sipping the little water he had from his canteen and just a, a little bit of candy, I think he had. He, uh, Stuart comes Mar uh, and his troops come uh, on the horses down the road and they see him under the tree and they know he's Confederate. And so they arrest him. Yeah, they arrest him. So he's still ill while he's got arrested. But so he first gets sent to Libby Prison in Richmond, Virginia, which by all accounts was the most notorious, most brutal, most uh, inhumane prisoner camp in the South. But luckily, he only stayed there for a few days. It was sort of a holding place. And then they transferred him to Camp Parole in Annapolis, uh, Maryland. But any camp, any on uh, either the north or the south, any prisoner camp was brutal. So to go into camp was not that much better than being out in the war. Because you were more susceptible to diseases in the hospital than you were outside the hospital. So Henry unfortunately dies at um, that uh, place and his father which was informed, his family was informed and his father went out and got his uh, remains which were buried in a, a small uh, cemetery next to the um, prison. So he had them disinterred and he was moved to 
Mount Auburn Cemetery in uh, Massachusetts, which was where the family tomb up here in the top is located. But Henry, um, there's lots of Pittmans in this uh, mausoleum, but Henry is not buried in the mausoleum itself. He has his own marker, upright marker over here on the left. But check out um, the door on the right. You see the picture of the iron door to the front of the mausoleum, a wrought iron door. And here, if you look at this emblem, it's the Hawaiian seal with his relatives on top. So it's the Hawaiian coat of arms. I found that it's so unique in uh, my cemetery journals. I was so excited when I found this. I went there and I, I took these pictures. So here's the next story is about the Hawaiians who served in the Confederate Navy. So this is an anomaly. In the last two years of the war, uh, the Confederacy was on the brink. They were not uh, performing, they were losing a lot of battles. You know, it seemed, they seemed doomed. So they took a long shot and they commissioned uh, four boats to go out in that, uh, th three boats to go out in the Atlantic and one boat to go out uh, in the Pacific. And that ship was the CSS Shenandoah. And their mission for the Shenandoah in the Pacific was to seek and hunt down whaling ships and merchant ships to steal all their cargo that they could sell back in the United States in the Confederate States and, and have some income there because they're financially, they were going down the drain big time. So here is the CSS Shenandoah uh, in the Pacific. And over a 12 month period, the ship sank or captured 38 Union whale ships, which represented more than half of the Arctic whale fleet worth $1.5 million. And it captured more than 1000 sailors. This is a, one of the most famous stories, uh, naval stories in Civil War history. You should look up this one. There's a lot of good books and articles online about the Shenandoah. So um, there, I found 10 sailors that were Hawaiian boys who were served aboard the Abigail, the US whaling ship Abigail, which was one of the captured ships. So here's, um, William Bill, John Boy, again, Boy, William Brown, James California, I don't think so, James French, uh, Henry Givens, Joseph Kanaka, Joseph Long, John Mahoy. Uh, Mahoy, we know that name, most of us know a Hawaiian name, Mahoy, and Cyrus Sailor. And um, they had a vessel and cargo valued at $16,000, which is big money today, today's market. So the sailors, so when the um, Abigail was uh, captured, they were told by the, their captors, okay, men of the Abigail, you have three choices. We can arrest you and we can throw you in the belly of the ship called the hold in irons. And you will have to sail wherever we sail under those conditions, or you can, at the next port we come to, no matter where that is, we'll drop you off and you're on your own. Thousands and thousands of miles from their homeland and in the kingdom or from any other place they recognize maybe. And the third choice they gave him was, okay, you can sign this piece of paper, pledging your allegiance to the Confederacy and then you will be official sailors of the, Ab of the Abigail, I mean, of our, sh of the, our ship. So, they took that option. Okay, we'll, we'll, we'll sail on with you. We'll sign the letter, we'll be sailors. My theory on this is that they didn't do that, join the Confederacy out of any sense of obligation, political obligation to support the North because the um, Hawaiians were mostly supportive of, the, of the, the Northerners, okay? Of the Union, not the civil, not the Confederacy. Um, so they did it out of my, my thinking is, if I do the other options, I don't have a whole, I'm in the hole of the ship or I'm homeless, thousands of miles away from my homeland. How do I, I don't have any money. I don't have anything, anything. So 
it wasn't really a, an option. So they, they joined the Confederacy. Uh, and you know what? The Abigail, uh, the, the uh, Shenandoah, the, they were taken aboard from Abigail to the Shenandoah. And the Shenandoah eventually escapes capture from Union ships and they ended up in Great Britain in London and the ship's crews were uh, dismissed over there. So all our Hawaiian boys that survived, they ended up in London, but I was never able to find the discharge papers in London. Uh, but we also know that one of the guys, William Bill died on the uh, Shenandoah of syphilis, which was a really sad story because the narrative I have of it, it is that uh, an officer had died around the same time and was given full military honors, burial at sea, wrapped in a, uh, a coffin of, of, that the carpenter ship guys made, and everybody had to stand at, uh, and, and salute the burial of this officer. But when it came to William Bill, who died just a few days later, he was shuttled back to the back of the ship with only officers present. So I, went, uh, I had, uh, you know, I got really emotional when I read that, that he, his burial at sea was um, not so good. Sad story, that one. Here's an anomaly. Um, Arthur Brown, who was born in 1837 to, and he died in 1865. He was not a member of the army, con the Union army, the Confederate army, nobody's army, nobody's, uh, Navy, Navy, uh, naval ships. He was a Confederate blockade runner from 1863 to 1864. Now I'll explain what a Confederate blockade runner is. On April 19th, 1861, President Lincoln proclaimed, uh, uh, um, issued a proclamation of blockade against Southern ports. And it was issued to block Confederate aligned ships both naval and commercial from delivering goods from Europe to Southern ports. This is a famous blockade. So this, the, the South during this uh, later period in the war was really hurting bad. They had, uh, you know, their supplies were very meager. Every, their weaponry, uh, everything that needed to go for the war effort, they had very little of. So what they started to do was import, um, increase the importation of goods from Europe, primarily in London, England, up here. And they would send these big, big cargo ships up there and bring back cargo ships all the way back to Bermuda. The big cargo ships, because they were so big, could not land in small ports in the South. So they had to stop in Bermuda, remove all the things from the big, big transport ships and divvy them up and put them into smaller gun runner ships, they called them. Uh, and then those gun runner ships would sneak in at night or, or something very clandestine to the various ports along the South to deliver the goods. It was a very dangerous job. It was a very illegal job, uh, but it was done on, on a big level. And those blockade runners, or at least the principals who own the companies, they made a lot of money. Crewmen like our, our guy didn't make anything hardly. So here's another map showing Bermuda and how they went to the how they went to the various blockade places to drop off goods. In the summer of 1865, he comes to Hamilton. The, uh, the capital of Bermuda, his ship landed there. And immediately the crew sees a terrible thing that was happening in Bermuda. And that was that yellow fever had hit the uh, islands very hard. People were dying left and right, hunt by the hundreds. And yellow, um, yellow fe they referred to it as yellow fever then, but um, yeah, it, it was, Big, big thing. People were lying in the streets. People were, you know, on filling up wagons and, and taking them. There were very few graveyards and they were spilling over the graveyards. It was, it was very tragic. 
at the time, um, Bermuda was a British colony and they ha had a, a very large military garrison of several hundred men there to protect the islands. And this was the, the major fort there, Fort B Bermuda. And they had a hospital there. Uh, they had a couple of hospitals uh, in Bermuda, um, but all of them were consumed by uh, people with uh, smallpox. And I have official information from Bermuda that um, our guy died on, Arthur Brown died on August 31st, 1864. There's a record of that. And it says he was buried uh, in Pembroke Parish Church, which is their picture of here, at the age of 27. But um, they have no record of burial record of him in the cemetery. So he's there, but he's not documented as being there. It could have been that he had a cross and it disappeared. It could have been that the cemetery became overwhelmed and they couldn't put up a marker, whatever, but he, he's not there. He's not actually buried there. So where is he buried? He's buried in Oahu Cemetery in the Brown family plot. So the Brown family came out here when Henry was, uh, I, I mean, uh, he was just a young boy and then uh, he's buried in the family plot there. Here's a picture of his marker. Arthur, eldest son of Thomas and Mary Brown died and was buried at Bermuda, August 31, 1864, aged 27, 27 years. So here's Arthur. Uh, yeah, I'm glad they put that up in his memory. Here's another anomaly. His name was uh, Alan Albert Brinsmaid, who was the captain who served in the Confederate, the Confederate, not the Union Army. Um, he was not a missionary son. He was a father. I mean, his father was Peter Brinsmaid, who was a co-founder of uh, Koloa Plantation on Kauai in 1835. And he started the first major sugar plantation in the islands. He and not two other guys. <clears throat> in 1862, Arthur married Isabella James from New Orleans, who was accused of being a Confederate spy, who was held under house arrest in New York for 40 days while an inquiry was conducted, after which he was found innocent and released. So uh, even though he married a, a, a prominent Southern belle, I could not find very much information about him and his service in the war. Uh, <clears throat> but it is documented that he did serve in the war and that he did, he was in Hawaii at his early youth. Okay, so uh, I leave with, and then we're gonna go to Q and A. It says here, a house divided against itself cannot stand. Who knows who issued that quote? A house divided against itself cannot stand. Abraham Lincoln, Abraham Lincoln said that. So it applies even today as we speak, there's much divide. So, and we're always talking about can our house remain united? So it's very apropos, this still relevant today, this quote. A house divided against itself cannot stand. Okay. Thank you so much, Nanette. That was so interesting. And it definitely covered, um, you know, from the RV to the Navy, which was fascinating. Like basically they were encouraged to be pirates, yep. um, <laughs> right? So I'm wondering if any, if there are any questions, I don't see any in the chat right now, but um, in fact, uh, we're gonna take you off the screen. Let's uh, let's get you to stop sharing screen. Can you, if you can hit stop share, and then we can. Um, great. So here we have one question. What other topics do you or will you cover in your book besides what you've mentioned here today? Oh, lots and lots of things. <clears throat> one of the most interesting things. 
I found in my journey in doing this story is, it's the story of outward migration of Hawaiians and outward migration of uh, non-Hawaiians from Hawaii uh, who went all over the world. And I, I'm amazed at the stories that, I, that I've learned from these people and where they went and what they were involved. They were, they were, they were in so many different states in the United States and, and foreign countries and things. And it, it just amazes me, the diaspora of our people right. from Hawaii across the globe. And I'm always amazed. And, I, and like, for, for example, what's the one I was just reading about? Uh, this guy, I'm doing this thing about this guy right now, who before the war, because his father was a trade guy in Hawaii, who took, took goods to the, uh, San Francisco and California, he ended up associated with the, the um, uh, with many things in California. And, and he did expedition in the in Oregon, <laughs> and and some guys were in Utah and doing the Mormon Wars, and the other guy is over here in New Mexico. I, I'm going, what? They're all over. They're all over the world. These toy and and, and, and in Hawaii. fact, there are many Hawaiian communities in other places that have yes. even been written about, such as you mentioned. Right. The, in the great Northwest, you know, right. Hawaiian, the Kanaka in the Northwest. We know about the LDS connection too, but there is a huge Hawaiian diaspora, isn't there? Yeah. Um, and, you know, I've lived uh, growing up, I lived on the East Coast too. And wherever we went, you know, we traveled a lot, but wherever we went, we always, somehow my parents, both of whom were born in Honolulu, always found the other people from Hawaii, wherever we were. It was right. either through alumni right. connections or family connections, or, you know, you just kind of, you, you just, you just, there's a radar, I think, somehow. But um, the diaspora is great, but nevertheless, um, you find other Hawaii people, they find one another. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, good. That's fantastic. Um, so what other, so this is the Civil War. I know that there actually is documentation. Um, our own Hardy Spore has um, written on reports Hawaiians in the American Revolution, Hawaiians in World War I, Hawaiians in World War II. Yeah. What is, what, what pattern do you see about uh, our soldiers going abroad and fighting for other places and other other issues? Well, good question. Um, a large part of it has to do with the fact that during the whaling period, um, Hawaiians were recruited heavily and served um, many hundreds, hundreds and hundreds of Hawaiians served on whaling ships. And the whaling ships went all over the place. And so they would maybe go to China and I mean, not to China, but other places around the Pacific and then in Atlantic and then they would end their term with the ship and then, oh, I will, I'll stay over here. Like there's a colony in Massachusetts of Hawaiians, you know, uh, and, and all around Northern states. Um, and so they found each other and created, you know, camaraderie amongst each other. And, and people ask me, well, why did, why did North uh, Hawaiians serve in the North as opposed to the South is, was, was it, because of political um, intent, but no, the answer is no, they didn't do that. They, they were, they were not, they were more in the middle. They just cared about race, you know, having a place to sleep and mostly, and um, having, have money, you know, to support themselves and their families. Some people supported families by being only whalers, right? And the kingdom at one point, the outflux of Hawaiians into the whaling industry and the merchant, merchant marine industry was so great, they were taking so many Hawaiians out of Hawaii that the government created a law saying you have to put down a bond for every resident Hawaiian that you want to take. And, and then if you don't bring them back, you lose your bond. And they were high bonds. Wow. So they were behooved, the captains were, or the owners of the company had to make sure they brought those guys back. Right. Yeah, right. it was a big, 
big thing because it was and, so and drain, some of drain the, on the other Hawaiians that have um, that we hear about that you know like the Kalakaua scholars abroad they went away most of them came back but not all of them right, right. Uh, Dr. Ben Young has written about Matthew Makalua, who then married a member of the Dewar's family, and he's buried in England there. And you might remember that I chased down um, the other one from Booth, James um, Koholo, James uh, Koholo Booth who attended military school in, um, in Naples, Italy. And we actually got into the Nunziatella and we found records about him, but he died there. The other, uh, Wilcox and the other one who went to military school Ooh. came back, but he didn't and he's buried there in, Nap in Naples somewhere. Yeah. So um, yeah, it's kind of interesting. And I think I got hooked on this from Dr. Ben Young and from Hardy Spore, but it's really interesting to follow the paths of Hawaiians who went abroad. Yeah, and there were a lot of them, a lot of them. Yeah, yeah, terrific. And a lot of that had to do with the fact that uh, Western colonization had, had been in Hawaii for long enough to disenfranchise Hawaiians. And they were losing their place in the kalo fields and in uh, self-sufficiency. They were losing their self-sufficiency. So they had to either work in, in major towns and villages uh, or go abroad to, to work, to get earn more money for their families or, or whatever, find a better life. than you know, they lost their traditional culture and they were trying to find their way in the world, this new world for, you know. That's a good point. And then there's a, the awesome story about Kaiana, you know, yeah. chief, they called him the Prince Kaiana. And it was the sandalwood trade, I think, that took him out of Hawaii. And he went up, you know, California to Alaska, to Russia and through Asia, or maybe it was the reverse route. But I know one time we took a Hawaiian health delegation to Alaska and we visited, well, we went to Anchorage, of course, and we met this kupuna who was descended. We had heard that she was descended from Chief Kaiana. So Hardy prepared um, this issue of the Hawaiian Historic Journal and, uh, you know, with his picture on it and a few other, you know, Hawaiian history artifacts and presented them to her. And she said to us, Yes, I know. I have this picture in my living room wall. <laughs> so, so she knows her genealogy. Her family knows that they're descended from Kaiana. Then we went oh, to wow. visit the town of Kaiana. It, it's really? spelled Kaiana, but they pronounce it Kaiana. Yeah. Um, we went to go visit it, and um, and everybody knows that it was founded by this great Hawaiian chief that was. Oh. And of course, we call him a prince or a you know a. a uh, a lesser chief, but, um, and then Kayana came back, right? So that is, that the, that is the anomaly in yeah, today's, yeah. you know, today's topic is that he actually came back yeah. and we know what happened to him, but he left, uh, <laughs> he left the whole trail of family members around the world, around the Pacific Rim. Yeah, so, the Hawaii, of, the story of the Hawaii Sons of the Civil War is this larger picture of Hawaii and political things that happened in the kingdom and political things that were happening in America. And so it's, it's all interconnected. How long have you been working on this? You said several years. Oh, 20 that, years, 20 years. 20 years. <laughs> do, what else do you have? Uh, what else are you juggling? What other historic history projects are you juggling? Uh, let's see. Yeah. My, uh, well, I'm still doing cemetery, a lot of my cemetery work. I, I was telling you earlier that I, I still do uh, workshops and tour. Well, not so many tours. I'm gonna start, I, I kind of stopped during COVID and I'm gonna start up again in January probably, uh, <clears throat> but still doing a lot of cemetery work. People call me all the time for this and that advice about cemetery. So uh, yeah, I'm still doing a lot of that. Yeah, you're definitely a wealth of information, especially with historic cemeteries. Um, let's see, I do see a question here. Um, congratulations, Nanette, the book should be super interesting. Here's a question about slavery. It, okay. Have you come across any evidence of Hawaiians being taken as slaves? Oh, good question. I have not. I have not. Uh, 
However, the question of slavery in all of the whole uh, Hawaiian language and non-Hawaiian language newspapers was full of slavery. And they were, um, and it comes up, they make a comparison between uh, writers were comparing slavery in the United States to some people were comparing uh, slavery, that there were slaves in Hawaii that were taken uh, as, as, as basically as slaves. And so there's, there's been that dialogue for many generations as to uh, the treatment of Hawaiians because of colonization and, and the extent to which they were just uh, put on such a low tier of society mm -hmm. and made to be working yeah. the rich people's homes and things like that. And in fact, there isn't there that story about Kamehameha fourth and fifth, the two brothers going across on the train and yeah, being yeah. treated poorly um, due to the color of their skin. And I'm wondering if perhaps, you know, that doesn't contribute to why they took the side of the, or we see more that took the side of the North than, than the South. Well, also Hawaii, uh, the kingdom declared was anti-slavery from way before the Civil War, yes. they did, there was they created a law of no slavery. You know, how how forward looking is that? Very, very much so. So I'm wondering if we have any more questions, either in our Facebook comments or um, here on Zoom. We welcome the questions. We've got just another minute or two with Nanette this afternoon, and then um, we'll you know. Everybody can go off and enjoy the rest of their day off. If you have a holiday today, we're really glad that you joined us. Um, if you've got questions, please write them down, put them in the Q&A, put them in the comments and uh, Momi or Momi Lenny will make sure that they get to me. Um, in the meantime, well, I'll tell you what, let's, let me take a really quick commercial break here. And um, let me tell you what's coming ahead for Papa Olalokahi. Uh, not this one. Um, so tomorrow we um, were scheduled to have a presentation by two women that are both Native American and Native Hawaiian, and this will be rescheduled. So if you have this on your calendar for tomorrow, you can go ahead and free up that time. Lisa Ka'anoi will, uh, our colleague Lisa will reschedule it and we will let everybody know when that's going to be rescheduled. Next week on November 16th at one o'clock, we have Dr. Poki'i Laws and Ivy Castellanos from the Alzheimer's Association here in Honolulu, and they'll be talking about memory and forgetfulness. And this is part of our Kupuna series. We look forward to bringing this to you. It's a partnership um, between Papa Ololokahi and the Alzheimer's Association. Uh, next week, Napu'uvai, our Native Hawaiian healthcare system that serves the islands of Lanai and Molokai, will feature three of its practitioners, all were students of Papa Henry Alwai, and they will be presenting uh, episode one of a three-part series called Food as Medicine, the famous uh, theory of Hippocrates, Food as Medicine. Um, here's another reschedule, although we know the date. This was in September. It has been rescheduled to November 22nd. It is um, possibly, not exactly, this, uh, this will be the final series in the Imi Keola Mau Amau, Navigating the Path to Recovery and Healing. And it features the Executive Director of White Bison. Uh, our own Lili Noi Kawahikoa will be facilitating this and we're looking forward to this presentation. Um, starting in December, we have a couple of workshops being presented by our health workforce uh, development hale called Mauliola Ma Lama Lama. They're the ones that administer the Native Hawaiian Health Scholarship Program. So I can see that I have these reversed, but starting December 1st, we're going to have informational workshops about Kako'o Ulu Oihana. And then starting in January, we'll be providing some workshops on how to apply for the Native Hawaiian Health Scholarship Program. So if you have any students or families that are interested in pursuing either of these opportunities, we encourage you to sit into one of these informational workshops to learn more and tips about how to apply. And um, finally, let me stop share, see, uh, oh gosh, I see one more question. Uh, oh, 
Oh, do you have a minute, uh, Nanette, or do you yeah, need to ahead. jump? Go ahead. Okay. Uh, this looks like a two-part question. Uh, oh, you know what, Celia, this actually is a topic. So the reason we have Nanette here, so uh, sorry, Celia's question is, can you track the diseases that were brought to Hawaii, number one, on particular ships? I think we can, especially the sexually transmitted diseases or influx of visitors from certain countries. So while Nanette is thinking out these questions, let me just say to the audience today that the reason we are talking with Nanette is because in September, she did some real interesting research. And that is she took a look at the story of 19th century epidemics in Hawaii as told through Hawaii's graveyards. We haven't presented that yet because of the timing of things that went on in September, but we do hope to present that again, even though it's, you know, history month is over. We're hoping to bring her back to um, tell the story of epidemics through Hawaii. So it, has, um, it has to, do, my, my uh, presentation has to do with, oh, am I on? Can you hear me? You yeah. are. Um, has to do with, the influenza in epidemic, cool. 1818 and 19, 1819. That's what the whole thing is about, that one. The great. So the questions um, today, can you track diseases brought in on specific ships or can you track them to certain countries of origin? Uh, yes, uh, they've been able to do that from the early days of shipping in the islands. Not the earliest days, but uh, from mid-century on. They, because they and they had to create uh, stations here to to where uh, a ship would come in and a, a health official would go on the ship and see what was going on health wise with the crew, and if there were any people suffering from any diseases, the ship was quarantined, and they had to go to an island in the harbor, uh, where a station was set up to. Uh, stay there until they figured out they had to quarantine over there, and, and then they would determine well what do these guys got right. So right. yeah, that started fairly early on in the kingdom because it was so many, so many diseases were coming to the islands. They had to do something to yeah, monitor so much this. Loss, yeah. yeah, we will bring that back. And Charmaine, good to see you again. This was a fascinating presentation and we will bring Nanette back again to talk about these epidemics and some more historical um, angles to this. So um, Nanette, thank you so much for okay. spending your afternoon with us. To all of you who participated, mahalo nui, aloha nui kako, aloha. Okay, ahuiho.